And along with Lionel Berger and Ron Laxer, we formed a subcommittee of Beth Tikva's Adult Education Committee dealing with Jewish figures in sports. We're fortunate to be working with Steve Gall and Gail Kurtzman. Tonight is the first of a series, and we're very fortunate to have Dan Schulman, who has long-standing ties to Beth Tikva, and Dan's son, Ben, who will be interviewing him. Ben grew up in Thornhill and is entering his third year at Syracuse University, where he's studying broadcast and digital journalism in the esteemed Newhouse School of Public Communications. Ben has worked for three different radio stations while at Syracuse. He is currently on air at WAER, and I guess it's Z89. Ben is also a sports writer and co-host of the Ostrom Avenue podcast for WAER. Previously, he worked as a weekly studio host for a sports radio program on WERW FM. Before going to Syracuse, Ben worked as a member of the production team for the morning show at Rogers TV Richmond Hill. He also served as a co-host for several episodes of the Sportsnet podcast, A Swing and a Belt. For the last two summers, Ben was a play-by-play -play broadcaster for the Barry Baycats of the Intercounty Baseball League, and he's currently play-by-play -play broadcaster for the Armouth Dennis Red Sox of the Cape Cod League. Ben aspires to work as a play-by-play -play broadcaster and studio host in the future. Dan Schulman grew up in Toronto and attended Western, where he received a degree in actuarial science in 1989. After working for a few months as an actuary, Dan decided to see if he could carve out a career in broadcasting. His first job was at CKBB in Barrie, where he stayed for 18 months before moving to CJCL, now known as the Fan 590. Dan stayed at the Fan for five years, hosting a variety of talk shows, including primetime sports and Blue Jay pre and post game shows before moving to television play by play. Dan was the voice of the Blue Jays on TSN from 1995 to 2001, while also working at ESPN, covering Major League Baseball and NCAA basketball. In 2001, Dan started working full-time for ESPN. He's called baseball and college basketball for ESPN for the last 25 years. Dan has been ESPN's lead voice for college hoops for the last 12 years and was the voice of Sunday Night Baseball for seven years before recently deciding to return to the Blue Jays. Dan has also covered events such as the Olympics, the World Championship of Basketball, the NHL, and the NBA during his career. Dan is a two-time winner of the Sports Media Canada Broadcaster of the Year Award, and in 2011 was named the top play-by-play -play announcer in the U.S. by the National Sportscasters and Sports Writer Association. Dan and Ben, please go ahead. Thank you very much for that intro. I appreciate it. I just want to say I'm very happy to be here and thank everyone who is attending to listening to me interview my dad today. Um, in terms of getting the questions off today, I just want to reiterate what Seagal said off the top. You can use the chat function and at any time during this interview, if you have any questions, put them in the chat. And once we conclude my questions, then I'll get into some of yours and we'll ask Dan everything that you want to know. So without further ado, let's get into it. Uh, Dan, you, you're a big sports broadcaster. You've been doing it for a long time, but like all sports broadcasters, you started out as a fan before you got into it professionally. So who were your, some of your idols growing up as a kid, not just on Toronto teams, but in all of sports? Well, uh, a couple of things. First of all, uh, I want to thank everybody for inviting me here tonight. Uh, ben, I'm not sure I can get through this with a straight face if you're going to call me Dan. I think you're going to have to call Should me Dan. Should I call you Dan? Uh, yeah, I, I think know, you're going to have to call me Dan. Okay, I'll call you Dan. <laughs> Um, and I'd like to commend you on having a bio almost as long as mine when I'm 53 yeah. years old and you're only 19 years old. That's some, that's some good writing on your part. But let me, let me tell people about Ben very briefly before I answer his question. Ben is off to a great start, is a total sports junkie as much as I ever was and maybe more, uh, and is doing a great job at Syracuse University and outside the school as well, getting involved with all kinds of different radio stations and podcasts. And, and even during the pandemic, he's doing a lot of work um, that you can find online on Twitter, on SoundCloud and, and staying busy and really working hard. So I'm very, 
proud of him and and my my hope one day is to work alongside him in some capacity whether it's tv radio us canada uh, I don't know, but that's my goal. So uh, forgive me, Ben. What was your question again? I forgot. Your, my question was, who were some of your childhood idols in sports growing up? Not just Toronto athletes, but in general. So uh, I grew up an enormous uh, sports fan, and I'm old enough that I can remember a time before the Blue Jays even. So as Ben knows, and I think like Ben, hockey was my first love. Uh, and my favorite athlete always was, is, and always will be. Uh, Daryl Sittler, the captain of the Toronto Maple Leafs of the 1970s. And one of the most nerve wracking moments of my career actually was interviewing Daryl Sittler for the first time when I was 25, 26 years old, whatever I was when I was at the fan. And, you know, it's one thing to have an idol when you're a kid. Uh, it's another thing to then be in a professional environment beside him when you're an adult. And I'm sure I stammered and hemmed and hawed quite a bit uh, when I interviewed him, but he would be by far the biggest. I love the Maple Leafs. As soon as the Blue Jays came to town in 77, uh, I was hooked on the Jays. They weren't very good early, obviously, as an expansion team. My favorite player from back in the early years was Willie Upshaw, first baseman for the Blue Jays, who I loved. And then my favorite basketball player, as Ben knows, and I'll, I'll try to stop saying as Ben knows every 30 seconds tonight, uh, was Dominique Wilkins of the Atlanta Hawks. Just a absolutely loved him. But um, I, I was a four sport guy, hockey, basketball, baseball, football, loved them all and, and just happened to wind up doing baseball and basketball as a career. And when did that fandom first start to turn into an interest in broadcasting? Well, that's a long story. <laughs> so, if it's the Western story, then, then, then soon I'll get back to it in a minute. Uh, get, you'll get back to the Western story. Yeah. Okay. So I, I did not think, not for a single moment, about being a broadcaster. Ben knew he wanted to be a broadcaster when he was 10 years old, probably. Uh, I did not know I wanted to be a broadcaster until I was in university and, and kind of fell into it sideways by accident without meaning to. So I, I always thought I'd do something in math, which is what I originally tried to do. I was a math, uh, you know, uh, math was my favorite subject and I thought I would do something with numbers. So at no point, ever before 19 or 20 years of age did I ever, ever, ever think about broadcasting as a career. It was, it was not the kind of thing. So my dad and, and one of my uncles are on the call tonight. And as I always say, uh, my Zadie, my dad and uncle's dad, Sam Shulman, came from Poland. He was a tailor, worked very hard, very traditional Jewish family. And as I like to say, there are only three branches on the Jewish vocational tree. There's the doctor branch, the lawyer branch and the accountant branch. And every showman was uh, gently coerced into choosing one of those branches. Now, a number of us went our, went our different ways, but um, uh, I was gonna wind up somewhere on the accountant branch. I wound up studying as an actuary. So, but it, it, it never really crossed my mind when I was a kid that you could get into broadcasting. There weren't, there weren't very many Jewish guys in broadcasting back then, and, and certainly nobody that I knew. So it, it wasn't really something that I thought about. I'd imagine when you, when you got to Western, you were one of the few actuarial science majors that was also calling Western Mustangs football games. Yes. Now you can let that story out. How did you get that opportunity? So uh, I, I go to Western, and um, – uh, my parents had always impressed upon my sisters and myself, and one of my sisters, I believe, is on the call right now, as I have impressed or tried to impress uh, on my kids, don't just go to school, get involved with things, extracurricular activities, whatever it is. And uh, I loved sports and I wanted to write. I went to Western in London, wanted to write for the Western Gazette. And my first day of Frosh Week went and uh, looked for the office and there were like 50, 60 people in line, 50 or 60 students in line trying to get in the door of the Western Gazette to write. So as much as I wanted to do it, and I had my parents' voices in the back of my head saying, do something, that was too many people in line for an 18-year-old in his first day at university to stand in it and wait. So I started walking back to my dorm, and before I got out of the main building, there was a door that said Radio Western. And I knocked on the door, and somebody said, come in. And I walked in, and I said, uh, is this the campus radio station? And they said, yeah. And I said, do you do sports? And they said, yep. And I said, you need volunteers. And they said, yeah. And that was September, whatever, fourth, fifth, sixth, whatever it was, 1985. And from that moment on, I started working at the, at the campus radio station at Western, which is not like what Ben's doing at Syracuse, huge U.S. school, huge broadcasting program. 
It was on a much smaller level, but that actually helped me because they needed people. And as Ben said, literally six days later, I was calling a football game. I was the color commentator for the second half of a Western Windsor football game six days later. And I started doing a talk show and basketball games. And I was really just doing it for fun. I made friends. I enjoyed it. It was, you know, a nice distraction. It wasn't for at least two or three years, really, that I started thinking about possibly making it into a career. And an ESPN production takes hundreds and hundreds of people. When you're doing these games at Western, you know, how bare bones is this? How, how responsible are you for the whole production, not just the broadcasting, but the engineering and the producing and stuff like that? Yeah, the number of people involved in the broadcast is equal to the number of broadcasters. So if it's a one person broadcast, there's one person. If there are two broadcasters, there are two people. And like you do, like you have learned to do, you set up the equipment, you take a little console about yay big and you plug it in and somebody's taught you how to make it work. Maybe sometimes for home games, you have an engineer, but for road games, you don't. Uh, and I, it's a long time ago, I've forgotten how to do it. Um, but uh, it's, it's, it's bare bones. Um, you know, there's no budget, obviously the whole thing is volunteer. It's just a, a wonderful opportunity at a university to, to get out and do some things. And I'm sure the university puts some costs, um, here and there. I remember once when Western made it to the, uh, the final eight of the Canadian basketball championships, which are in Halifax all the time, or were back then at least. And, um, they said, we'll, we'll fly you out to do the games but there are two catches. One, we're not going to put you up in a hotel. There's a family we know out there who's willing to take you in. So I billeted with a family in Halifax for three days. And to make it more cost effective, I didn't just call Western games. I think I called Brandon games and Alberta games. I called tons of games while I was out there because you got to, um, you know, some schools couldn't send people. So they used the Western guy who, who went out there. But you know, when you work at a really, really, really small place, two things. One, you have to do everything so you learn. And two, if you make mistakes, it's okay. And I, and I made a lot of mistakes, and, but it, it was on a smaller scale, so it wasn't a big deal. After you left Western, you still went the actuarial route rather than broadcasting for the first little bit of your time post-grad. How did yeah. you end up getting to CKBB where you first got your first job? <laughs> So I started off as an actuary. I was very grateful to my parents uh, for putting me through university. And I intended to work as an actuary. I didn't intend to get into broadcasting, really. And I'd say within three months, I knew that I wasn't happy. And um, I'm not the sharpest knife in the drawer, but I knew I was going to have to do whatever I was going to have to do for about 40 years. And I said, you know what, if I'm going to investigate something else, why not do it now? before you're married, before you have kids, before you have a mortgage. You know, my silly little joke is I had my midlife crisis at 22 and I'm very grateful for that because I figured out some things that I wanted to do. So uh, I went to my parents and made a deal with them. I, I said, this is what I'd like to do. Give me two years to see if I can make a career of it. And I said, and I'll make you a deal. And uh, Seagal, you can unmute my parents if they ever want to uh, disagree with anything I'm saying, but I think it's relatively true. You Actually, keep them muted. I, yeah, no, take that back. Keep them muted. <laughs> um, I went to my parents and I said, give me two years and, and, and here's the deal I'll make. I'll write the GMAT, which is the, uh, the standardized test uh, that allows you to get into business school. I said, I'll write the GMAT and I'll have that in my back pocket. Uh, I felt confident I could do well on it. I'll get a deferred acceptance, whatever. Give me two years. And if it doesn't work out, I'll go to business school. And, and they said, okay. And they were nervous. They weren't opposed, but they were nervous. Again, there were very few Jewish kids doing this kind of thing. The two I can think of who were a few years older than me were Ken Daniels and Howard Berger. Those were the two Jewish guys that I can think of in the business. But I was supposed to be an actuary. And not only that, my grandfather was still alive, my dad's dad. And uh, going and telling him was, was more stressful for me than going and telling my parents. And my Zaidi took it okay. Um, he, he didn't live very much longer. He only lived another, geez, six, eight months, I think, after I made the change. So unfortunately, he never saw, you know, kind of where it took me. But um, he, he was okay with it, too. He and I had a very special relationship, and it was important to me that he approved. Not that... Had he disapproved, I wouldn't have done it. But again, I, I knew I'm the oldest son of the oldest son in a very traditional Jewish family. Everybody on the call can understand a little bit. 
Um, I hope I didn't offend my uncle Hesh, who's the second son, not the, uh, <laughs> but actually my Zadie's not the oldest son. Sorry, I was the oldest son of the oldest son of my Zadie. Um, but uh, it was really important to me that, um, that my Zadie approved. So, so Ben, to answer your question, after about four or five months, I started looking around for radio jobs. And what are your, some of your favorite memories from that first experience at CKBB? Of course, it wasn't just a sports role. It was a lot more than that because it's a small local radio station. So, so what sticks out to you from your time there? One funny thing, to get to CKBB, again, this is 1990. And there's no internet. You can't, you can't do anything. And so what I did was I took some old uh, stuff that I had done at Western and I'm I don't know where I did it or how I did it, but I made up cassette tapes, like 45 cassette tapes and sent them out to every radio station I could think of, called people, like literally would call 411 in London and say, okay, do you, what's the name of the news radio station there? And the operator would tell me and I'd say, could you put me through? And then I'd say, who's the news director? And I'd try to get somebody on the phone. Most of the time I didn't even get somebody on the phone. Most of the time I got somebody on the phone. They didn't want to talk to me. I would say three or four people let me drive and meet them. And I drove to like Peterborough or Kitchener, wherever I went. And I got one job offer and it was at CKBB on the weekends. So for about two months, I was an actuary Monday to Friday and a newscaster Saturday, Sunday. And I'm quite certain I'm the only actuary slash newscaster that has ever been at the same time uh, in, in world history. But it was great again, because it was smaller. Now it was obviously bigger than Western but it was a smaller station. I had to do everything. I did news, sports, weather, covered elections, covered the courts, uh, read a farm report, read, uh, they had pet patrol, which was a lost and found for pets that you would read. I learned how to splice tape. I learned how to do interviews. I learned how to record things. Um, and I met all kinds of people I never would have met otherwise, many of whom I, I still keep in touch with. The, the people who worked at that station, many of them went on to, to really cool jobs all over the place. So it, it's, it's one of those things like, you know, how your first car isn't your nicest car, but it, it, in many ways, it's your most sentimental and favorite car. That, that's how I think of CKBB in many ways. And then how do you take that opportunity and use it to move up to a major sports network? What's the the next step between small market and something like the fan? So the next step for me, and this will be a recurring theme, is I got a little bit lucky. I had a friend of a friend of a friend who worked at CJCL, which is the fan, but it was called CJCL then. And that got me in the door. It got me in the door for an interview with somebody. And at the time, uh, it wasn't an all sports station. They had newscasters reading sports on the weekend. Uh, so by this time, I've left my actuarial job on Monday to Friday in Barry. They had newscasters reading sports on the weekend. And they said, okay, well, we'll keep you in mind, and, and, but we're not really looking to hire you know, extra sports people now. It's not on the budget. And then the next week, uh, a golfer named Mark Kalkovecchia won a golf tournament. And the newscaster, who wasn't a sports fan, kept calling him Mark Kalkovecchia instead of Mark Kalkovecchia over and over and over again. And on Monday morning, my phone rang and they told me that story and they said, we need a sports guy. And uh, I was offered a sports position to read sportscast Saturday and Sunday morning. So Monday to Friday, I was in Barry. Saturday, Sunday, I was in Toronto. And that's, that's how I got my start at CJCL, like a total fluke, one of several total flukes that I've had in my career. But I will say this, and I don't know if Ben knows this or if this is the next question. After one weekend, they decided I wasn't ready. And they took me off the air. But the news director there said, when you, when you finish in Barrie every Friday and you drive back down to Toronto, I was still, I had moved back in with my parents after university. Uh, they, they said, he said, come by the station and bring your tape. And every Friday I would go in and sit down with a guy named Scott Metcalf, who was very important to me in, at the beginning of my career. And about three months later, they put me back on the air. And it's, you know, you got to be, you got to work hard. You got to be a little lucky. You got to have some good timing and all of those things help. And so that experience was at the Fan 590 was in more of a studio hosting role rather than one of play-by-play. -play. Yeah. What could you take away from something like that that helped you in your future career as a play-by-play -play broadcaster? You know, it's funny. I didn't even know I wanted to be a play-by-play -play broadcaster. My only goal was to work at a Toronto radio station. I wanted to work in Toronto. And I started off at CJCL, even doing a little news, sports, Soon thereafter, I found myself at Maple Leaf Gardens or Skydome, as it was called, then interviewing players like it was crazy. I was 
23, 24 years old. And all of a sudden I, I'm in that kind of an environment. I would do sports casts. I would do whatever they wanted to do. Some of the stuff was behind the scenes, wasn't even on air. Um, but as, as I tell broadcasting students, young kids like yourself who are getting into it, whatever they ask you to do, say yes, do it, and then go back and say, what else do you want me to do? And if you do 10 different things, that's great. They'll figure out what you're best at, or you'll figure out what you're best at, or you'll figure out what you like the most, or maybe you'll wind up doing three or four things because the more versatile you are, the more valuable you are. So that, that's something that I try to do. So in 1994, you had a major opportunity. You went to Lillehammer, Norway to broadcast yeah. hockey and basketball at the Olympics. What are some of your memories from that trip, not just on the ice or on the court, but also just the experience as a whole? So another major, major break. CBC forever did the Olympics, forever, until 1992 and 1994. Uh, so I wasn't really... Uh, working in Toronto full-time doing TV. Like I, I had just got, gotten established in 1992, but it, it, CTV had the Olympics in 92 and 94, and they didn't really have enough people. So a gentleman named John Shannon offered me the opportunity to go to the Olympics and call hockey. And I don't even know if I, I as I think back, the only hockey I had done was in Barrie. When I was working at CKBB, I did what was then known as the Junior B League. Now I think it's called Ontario Junior A. I did the Barry Colts games, like the Barry Colts. Uh, and this before they were in the OHL. This is, you know, Barry versus Collingwood, Aurelia. That's what got me a job at the Olympics. Like John Shannon must have been out of his mind, and, and, th and, I'm, and God bless him for it. But he offered me the – I don't think I'd done any other hockey. He offered me the opportunity to go to the Olympics. And I was the number two hockey guy. Don Chevrier, the late great John Chevrier, did all the Canada games. I did all the non-Canada games. But I was only 27 years old. I mean, what, what a phenomenal opportunity and still the only Olympics I've ever been to. And, and, and it was great. Um, the Norwegian people couldn't have been nicer uh, to be. I, I love international sports. So to be in an Olympics, to meet all kinds of people, trade stuff, learn, you know, learn all kinds of things about people from other countries. Um, the games I did were inside a mountain. Norway wanted to be very environmentally respectful. So they carved out the inside of a mountain to make it into a hockey rink so they wouldn't have to build anything or disturb anything. So it's almost like driving into the bat cave. You would drive into this tunnel and you would get inside the mountain and you would look up and you would see rock up above and there was a hockey rink there. And I don't know how they pulled it off. There were, I think, 6,000 seats in the arena. And one funny story we were told is people lived on top of the mountain. And every time somebody would score a goal and everybody would cheer, all of their dishes in their cabinets would rattle around because everybody was stomping and, and cheering inside the mountain. But it was a fantastic, uh, fantastic experience. And my only regret is I was a little too young and inexperienced to realize how special it was. And I, I don't know that I savored it enough. Uh, you know, I thought probably I'd go back and do more Olympics and, and I've never had that opportunity. So after that, you took over as the full-time Blue Jays broadcaster in the mid to late 90s and then early 2000s. You got that job at just 28 years old. Were you nervous going into it? Did you feel ready to take on an MLB job? I was terrified. Um, and, and I got lucky again. Uh, Jim Hewson, who, if people are hockey fans, will know is the lead voice of Hockey Night in Canada forever used to be the Blue Jay guy on TSN and then decided he wanted, it was too much doing both sports year round. And he, uh, I think wanted to move back to Vancouver or live full-time in Vancouver and do hockey. And all of a sudden the Blue Jays had an opening in 1995. I had done one inning of baseball in my life. In 1994, it must've been, uh, I was down at spring training for the fan and Tom Cheek and Jerry Howarth let me do one inning of a spring training game on radio. Uh, I, I was kind of known as being a baseball guy. I did a lot of the pre and post game shows, but I had never done baseball play by play. Uh, ben had done more baseball play by play by the time he was 17 years old than I had done when I took over the, doing the Jays. And I auditioned for the job in November, was terrified, was sick. Uh, you can ask Buck Martinez the story, was sick as a dog, did the audition, didn't even, was so naive, I didn't even realize that there were management type executives listening to it in another room or studio or part of the building. And I couldn't hear them. That's how naive I was. I didn't know they were there because I couldn't see them, I should say. And they called me into the office after the audition and said, thank you very much. We'll be in touch. And they called me the next day and they said, 
thanks, but no thanks. And I went, okay. No, well, I, I didn't expect to get it anyways. I was a kid, as you said, Ben, and went back to the fan. I was doing talk shows. And then three months later, in February of 95, I get a phone call out of the blue saying, are you still interested in the job? So I don't know who they tried to hire. I don't know why they didn't hire him, but I'm just grateful that whoever it was turned them down or asked for more money or whatever it was. Um, I, I always like to say I had some things going for me. I was local and I was cheap. And that, that's probably why they hired me. And of all the breaks I've had, I think getting the Blue Jay job in 1995 is the biggest break that I've ever gotten because that paved the way for so many things, both in Canada and the U.S. But to answer your question, Ben, I was petrified. Uh, absolutely. You know, going, it was national TV. I'd done very little TV. I'd done very little baseball play by play. And I remember being extremely nervous when I started in 1995. And Buck was your partner for most of your time with the Jays. How important was he to your development as a baseball broadcaster? And as you answer this, I apologize. My computer is slightly low battery, so I'm just going to mute myself and plug in, but I'm paying attention. <laughs> Kids today. Um, Buck was incredibly important. Buck had been a player forever. Buck had been a broadcaster with the Blue Jays. Buck had been a broadcaster with ESPN. I was a broadcaster at ESPN at that time. And Buck taught me a thousand things that I either never would have learned or it would have taken me a long time to learn. I would have made a lot of mistakes. And uh, we got along great right off the bat. He was incredibly important to me, uh, as were, you know, the producer and the director and a lot of the crew, um, as Ben and I talk about, it's uh, TV's a team sport. It's not just the two people you see on TV. There are a lot of people making a broadcast happen. Um, but Buck was, uh, Buck was great. You know, he, he helped me avoid some, some big mistakes. And if there were small ones, he would, he would help me through it. And, and uh, you know, I didn't realize how much I had to learn. I was so green. I just had no idea what I had to learn. But, you know, having a guy who had been around as long as he had was very helpful. And so you have the Blue Jays job for a couple of years. How then do you make the jump to the States and become a part of ESPN, the largest sports broadcasting company, maybe in the world, but definitely in the United States. Okay. Another break, which will sound like I'm making this up, but Ben can verify it and my parents can verify it. In 1993, this is before, I'm not doing the Blue Jays yet. I'm, I'm at the radio station and I'm doing sports casts at night, every half hour. And say I do one at 11 p.m. And at 11.05, my phone rings. Oh, not my phone. You didn't have cell phones then. The, the, the newsroom phone rings and I answer CJCL. And there's a voice on the other end that says, is this Dan Shulman? And I say, yeah. And he says, my name is Al Jaffe and I'm calling from ESPN. And we'd like to fly you down to Bristol, Connecticut to do an audition for us. Now, again, no internet, ESPN. I don't know that much about it. I've never heard of ESPN radio. It's a long time ago. And I think it's my university roommate, Rob, who's punking me. So I say on the phone, well, that's pretty good, Rob. I said, you even gave yourself like a New York Jewish accent. That was, that was pretty well done. You got me. And there's this long pause on the phone. And then I hear a voice say, I'm going to say this again. My name is Al Jaffe, and I'm calling from ESPN. And I'm going, oh, God, now I've screwed it up. This guy's real. Um, and I'm still a little suspicious. So I say, I've got one more sports cast out. Give me your, your number. Let me call you back right after I do it. So he does. And it's a Connecticut phone number and I call it and he picks up. And th to this day, I don't understand how this happened again, pre-internet. So you're actually tuning the dial to try to get a radio station and CJCL was 1430 at the time. And I am told that he had heard there was somebody in Rochester or Albany on 1420 that he should listen to. And he accidentally found me in Canada from Connecticut when he was looking for somebody else, listened for a few minutes, evidently thought I was okay, called me and said, would you like to come down and audition? So I started doing ESPN radio on the weekends while I was still at CJCL. And then when I went to the Blue Jays, uh, gave up the, had to give up both to do the Blue Jays, and, but, but they knew who I was. And Somebody got sick one day and they needed somebody to fill in as a play-by-play -play guy on a baseball game on ESPN TV. And I was available. Again, being available is one of the best things you can be. <laughs> and they called me and I did a game for them. And it, it kind of just went from there. And so eventually you worked your way up to Sunday Night Baseball, the biggest baseball show in the country. And you worked with a lot of different people during your seven years. You worked with L.A. Dodgers pitcher Oral Hershiser, longtime manager Terry Francona, women's softball star Jessica Mendoza. 
who were some of your favorite people that you got to share the booth with during your time at ESPN? It, it, it's hard to, uh, to start naming too many people because I'll leave people out. Um, but, but, you know, Ben knows this too. Oral Hershiser and I, I loved working with him. Loved working with Oral. Worked for, with Oral for a number of years. Uh, Terry Francona, and, and if there are any Montrealers on the call, they remember uh, Tito fondly from his days with the Expos. I'm sure he was great. John Cruck and I got along and get along great. I love John Cruck. But the closest one, um, and, I, and I'm a little nervous to say this because he's now the manager of the New York Yankees, but he's my friend and he was my friend before. I worked with Aaron Boone for years and Aaron is uh, one of my closer friends. He really is. And uh, we, always, we always have this discussion. He says, who do you like more, me or the Blue Jays? And, and I never answer the question because he wants me to support the Yankees, but he, he understands. So um, if I had to pick one guy, it's Aaron. Ben has met Aaron many times. And in fact, uh, one time back when Aaron was still at ESPN, and as was I, when we were both working together, Ben went through a phase where he was a huge soccer fan. And Aaron has a son who is a huge soccer fan. And we took a, a trip of a lifetime in, in the winter. We went to Spain and saw, who did we see them? We FC saw Barcelona. Barcelona and they yeah. played FC Ibar, but I don't remember. Yeah, we, we saw FC Barcelona and it was really, I'd never been to a soccer match in my life. I'd never been to Spain in my life. Aaron and I had no idea what we were doing, but it was for the boys who, who had a great time. So if I had to pick one person. And first of all, I'd like to say that I think it was more than a phase. I'd like to say I'm still a soccer fan, but right. maybe not as diehard as I was then. Um, but you've had, a, you've had a lot of big moments in your baseball broadcasting career. You had the bat flip 2015, the David Freeze home run in 2011. You were even at the infamous Chicago Cubs Bartman moment. What sticks out to you the most? Can you pick one moment or if not just a couple of moments that – really define your career that you look back on as the, the defining moments of, of your broadcast career? You, you pick three of the biggest. Um, I've been very fortunate. ESPN does not have the baseball playoff rights to the baseball playoffs. ESPN radio has the radio rights. So I've been doing the radio uh, playoffs forever. And the Steve Bartman game, the Cubs game, uh, if people don't know where the fan touched the ball, the Cubs went on to lose the game in 2003. I did that game. Uh, David Freeze uh, hitting a triple to tie uh, game six of the 2011 World Series and then hitting a homer to win it in the 11th inning. Uh, and then this game right here, the third one Ben mentioned, when Bautista uh, won it. I did that game for ESPN Radio. And, th and that was extra special because Ben and another son of mine, Matthew, and my parents were in the stands. And they're all huge Blue Jays fans. So for them to be at that game and to be broadcasting for my hometown, not for my hometown team, but broadcasting my hometown team in a game of that magnitude was, was really, really exciting. Like, I won't lie. I, I mean, I, when you work for a national network like ESPN, TV, radio, doesn't matter. You try to be neutral. You're supposed to be neutral at, at all times. But, um, you know, to do a game that big for the team that you grew up following was, was pretty special. And speaking of broadcasting the hometown team, in 2016, you came back to broadcast the hometown team, doing a handful of Blue Jays games that you've extended now, even into this season. What was the motivation for you to come home and rejoin the Blue Jays broadcast on Sportsnet? Well, I think sentimentally, I thought I always wanted to come back. Um, I also was looking just to kind of change up my lifestyle a little bit. I was traveling like crazy and I wanted to be home a little bit more. And part of it, um, an ongoing theme here tonight, had to do with Ben. Ben was a good baseball player and played rep baseball for the Thornhill Reds for many, many years. And I was his coach for many, many years. And I could coach Ben and do Sunday night baseball. Most of our games were during the week. Our practices were during the week. I would miss some tournament games. When Ben decided uh, not to play baseball anymore, when he was, I don't know, 15, 16 years old, yeah it gave me the opportunity to, to kind of come back. And I'd had ongoing discussions with the Blue Jays over the years uh, about the possibility of coming back, but just kind of the timing was right. And um, I, I'm very happy that I have, and I hope I, I hope I get to continue doing Blue Jays games for a long time. It was mentioned in your intro, but in 2011, you won the National Sportscaster of the Year Award in the United States, joining a list of some of the greatest all-time broadcasters, like John Madden and Chris Berman and Jim Nance, 
you're still the only Canadian to ever win that award. What does that kind of recognition mean to you from people within your industry? It's, it's, I won't lie. It's, it's very nice. It's very flattering. It, it shocked me. I don't know if you remember. Do you remember where we were, Ben, when I found out I won the award? I don't remember where we were. I remember the, getting the award, but I don't, I don't remember. We were skiing and we were in the car coming home from a ski day and my cell phone rang. And that's uh, and they told me that I had won that award, which I don't even know if I knew I was nominated for. I, I don't even remember that. But um, it was it was very special. You know, as you said, when you see the names on the list, like uh, Bob Costas, Al Michaels, Jim Vance, Jack Buck, um, it, I, I feel a little sheepish that that I was there. But I think the nicest thing, and I think a lot of people say this, it was it was recognition from my peers. The voters are all other broadcasters, and and it was it was very very special you know and you came to the ceremony and matthew came and bobby and zadie came and it was um it was it was really nice it, it uh it, it's i don't think about it all that often because i tend to focus just what's my next game what's my next assignment but um you know i i it, it does feel really nice so we're going to do a couple more questions there's then going to be some audience questions and rabbi g has some questions we got a few rabbi g and then we're going to get yeah and then we're going to get to <laughs> all the good questions and i'll stop talking um okay. just want to touch a little bit you're you're a baseball broadcaster but you're also a basketball broadcaster and right now specifically a college basketball broadcaster but you have done the nba in the past what about college is special to you or makes it such a different game than the professional game the the environments the atmospheres the the, the students the craziness the noise it, it, it's great and and um now i started off doing games between schools that nobody on this call would ever have heard of it wasn't like it was an overnight thing but i've been very fortunate you eventually uh, to eventually start doing games at places like north carolina kentucky kansas duke places like that and it, it's really special um you know i've been you've come with me to a few of them and i i've loved that and um, it, it's it's super super loud, and it, it the games I do, I'm very lucky. They feel like they really matter. You know, the seasons are shorter, the passion is there because you have so many young people, so many students um, in, in the arena, and uh, I really like it. I'll tell a quick story. I'm going to turn this back on you, Ben. So Ben used to be a pretty big Michigan basketball fan before he went to Syracuse. There was a Canadian guy named Nick Stauskas who played in the NBA, who played at Michigan. I was doing a game at Michigan State, and I took Ben with me, and the coach at Michigan State, who I know well, was nice enough to let Ben come to practice with me. Ben was maybe 10 years old. And I had let it slip that Ben was a Michigan fan, and we're going into a Michigan State practice. So we get into the practice, and the coach says, is this your kid? And he's kind of pretending to be loud and a little rough. And, and I go, yeah. And he calls over Dave Pruder, who's the equipment guy. He goes, Dave, come here. He goes, take this kid in the back and don't bring him out until he's green from head to toe. And Ben comes out with like a duffel bag of Michigan State stuff and a track suit and a hat and everything, the works. And I, I give Ben credit. He pretended for those two hours that we were at practice that he really, really, really liked Michigan State. And there was some good gear in there, but he was still a Michigan fan when it was all said. I sat in the student section and That's right. <laughs> quietly <laughs> cheered from Michigan. Thankfully, the people around me were nice. And yeah. I was sitting beside a guy from Canada and I told him I was from Canada and he said, Oh, so you're also just quietly cheering for Stauskas. And I said, I yeah. said, yes, you know, I have to be. Yeah, um, good parenting by me to stick my 10 or 11 year old kid in the student section at a, at a college basketball game. So now we're going to do just a quick rapid fire before we get to the viewer questions. Just want to talk a little bit about the current Blue Jays and, Although there might not be a current season, we'll work under the assumption that there might be. And I want to list off five of some of the pretty up-and-coming guys on the team and just give me a quick one- to two-sentence answer of what you like about them going forward. So first, young catcher broke in last year, Danny Jansen. Uh, Danny Jansen, firstly, is one of the nicest people uh, you'll ever meet. He is a mensch in every sense of the word. Love Danny Jansen. Uh, he's worked hard on his defensive skills. I think he's going to hit. I think he's going to be a leader on the team. And I think he's going to have a nice long career. I'm all in on Danny Jansen. Lourdes Goriel Jr. I'm pretty all in on Lourdes Goriel Jr. I'm envious of his hair. I'm envious of a lot of people's hair on the, on the, on the Blue Jays. But Lourdes has 
Bo's got great hair. Vladdy's got good hair. Lourdes's might be the best. Um, here's my hope for Lourdes Gurriel. Just leave him in left field. No more shortstop, no more second base. Leave him in left field. Maybe a little first base if, if you need him there. Um, I think Lourdes can really hit. If Lourdes can lear learn how to not chase outside the strike zone, I think Lourdes is going to be an exceptional player. Now get into some of the bigger names. Kevin Biggio. Big Kevin Biggio fan. Another mensch. Absolute mensch. If I, if I did a seven-game homestand last year and I saw Kevin every day, every day he would shake my hand. Um, he's, he's, he's so polite. He's, so, he's a little serious sometimes. Um, just another great kid. Really great kid. Dad was a great guy. Um, I don't think Kevin's ever going to hit 320, but I think Kevin will hit 25 homers, steal 25 bases. I think he'll play probably a number of different positions. I know it's mostly second base now, but as time goes on, you know, maybe Bichette moves to second. Things could move around. You never know. Uh, but I think Kevin Biggio is going to be a very important guy on this team, not only between the white lines, but in the clubhouse as well. And then there's a lot of good things to say about this guy, Bo Bichette. Yeah, uh, he's special. I think Bo Bichette wakes up every day trying to figure out what he can do to be the best baseball player in the world. I think he is that determined to be as good as, as, as he can be and to overcome the naysayers and the doubters. I'm not too small. I don't have to move to second. I don't swing too hard. You know, any Blue Jay fan, I'm sure, was electrified by him when he came up. Uh, I did the games in L.A. last year when he hit the home run off, hit two home runs, I think, off Kershaw, right? Did two home runs off yeah, Kershaw. Yeah, he hit two. Just, I mean, it was, it's crazy. And, and he is – he's going to use every ounce of energy that God gave him to be the best player that he can be. And, and I uh, – he's got a fire in his belly. And, and, you know, again, like Jansen's a quieter guy. Biggio's a quieter guy. Then you got Bo, who's got he, – he's quiet in some ways, but he is fiery. And I think his personality – um, is very important to the team. And I think he's also very important to the guy who you're going to ask me about next. But. Yeah, and the name speaks for yeah. itself, <laughs> Vladimir Guerrero Jr. Uh, so we didn't – I think we're all expecting a little more than we saw, and I think we'll get there. I was really curious to see what this season was going to be like for Vladdy if it had started on time. It looked like he had lost a little weight, coming in good shape. I've never met anybody in baseball who has said he's not going to hit. I have met a few people who worry about his size and that he's going to have to work on that. But if he can do that, he'll hit. Whether it's third base, first base, DH, I don't know. But they'll figure that out. They can find somebody else to play third base. They've got a great young prospect who I think will be their future third baseman. Um, I get excited thinking about – you can ask Ben. After the draft last week when they took um, uh, Austin Martin, I immediately texted Ben my vision for the 2023 lineup. And I, I get giddy over that. They, they've got a great young nucleus of, of position players. And I, I think they're going to be a lot of fun. Yeah, they are definitely going to be a lot of fun in the future. I have some other questions, but I want to get everyone else involved who's been watching. So if we have time, I'll circle back to them. Before we do the audience questions, though, Rabbi G has some questions for you. So I'll hand it over to him. All right. Thanks, Ben. First of all, I want to thank both of you for doing this. I really appreciate it. It's uh, always wonderful to have you participate in the Beth Tikva community. And, and uh, you know how, what huge fans we are of your parents, Dan, and uh, we love them so much. And uh, uh, look at the father and son team here. This is really amazing. <laughs> um, actually, my question, I understood about 50% of what you guys were talking about for the past hour, which is pretty good for me. Uh, but you know, I'm a rabbi. I gotta, I'm going to bring some seriousness into, into this discussion. Um, I was going to ask this question just to you, Dan, but I think I want to ask both of you this question and see if maybe between the generations uh, there may be a different perspective. You know that we're dealing with some big issues in the world today. If the virus wasn't enough, the issue of the day uh, is racism and uh, social inequality that's really gripping uh, the United States and, and, and the major cities of Canada as well. Uh, there's a lot of people who say, look, sports is our escape from those heavy issues. Sports is, um, is a healthy distraction where we can leave the politics and the radicalism aside. And I wanna ask both of you, do you think 
that sports, the world of sports has something unique to contribute to that discussion and also whether your Jewish identities play into your answer. Do you think your Jewish identities influence uh, the way you look at this issue and look at your both of your roles in the sports world um, that that many have said you know is part of uh, this institutional culture of inequality that needs to be addressed in, in the wider society. Take a stab. Ben, why don't you go first, buddy? I'll go first. Um, I think I think in ways sports can contribute to both both helping and hurting. I think that there are definitely good things that sports provide to us. I think they provide, especially when we're talking about social inequality, the, the nice thing, or at least what we like to think about sports, is that everyone has an equal opportunity, especially in a sport like baseball, where one year a guy like David Ortiz might be the best player, and another year a guy like Jose Altuve is the best player, one being massive and the other tiny. And I think that that, that kind of image to be put out to people has a, a positive impact, especially a sport as diverse as baseball. And... I think definitely in talking about baseball, my Jewish identity would play into that just because I think if you look at the, the quote unquote big four sports, the one that Jewish people have maybe made the biggest impact in would be baseball. And I think that in baseball, people from various different cultures and identities can find heroes and see all the people playing together, you know, guys like Sandy Koufax and Jackie Robinson and Ralph Branca and guys like that, you know, they're all playing on the same team together. So I think when you watch a team sport where there are people from various different backgrounds and identities coming together and contributing towards one goal, I think that really does shed a positive light on the rest of the community. But at the same time, I think we need to be careful to not excuse sports because I think in some way sports do contribute to some of the inequality that we see. Uh, to follow up on that, um, uh, Rabbi Grover, I, I think sports can be both. I, I think it's great that they can be a, a nice distraction, especially during a time like this when we're all looking for some good, healthy distractions. But I think, and I think we're seeing this from the leaders in the various sports now that they have a responsibility to, to lead the way as well and, and to help people see things differently and to promote equality and uh, I think we've seen more of that in the last few weeks than at any point in my lifetime uh, that I can remember. So uh, in, in terms of being Jewish, um, it, it's not really something I, I feel or encounter very much in my in my day to day life in the industry. Um, but I would hope that, you know, people who are showing themselves to be anti-racist now are anti-racism of all of all kinds that um you know it's not like well a, this certain group needs to be treated better but this certain group i'm still not going to treat as well so uh, i think i've been very fortunate i don't feel i have hardly ever uh, felt any kind of anti-semitism in my career i would say three or four moments where there have been comments that have startled me a little bit. I'm sure there are others behind the backs of, of Jewish people who are, who are in the game. But it, if what's going on in the, in the last few weeks, you know, as hard as a lot of it has been to watch, and unfortunately, some of it has turned violent, and there's been some looting, but I'd like to think most of it is peaceful, and I'd like to think it's going to get us all to a better place. Do you have another question, Rabbi G, or should I go to the uh, the viewers? No, that was great. You guys, you guys uh, both gave very good answers. You can you can turn now to your audience that knows a lot more about the things you want to talk about than I do. <laughs> All right, there's a lot. Of, there's, we're going to get a lot of current MLB questions now. So we had Ronald Laxer sent in some early questions. So I'll uh, these three. I'll warn you, Dad, pertain to the Houston Astros scandal. Okay. So. Did you have any hint of the fact that the Astros or the Red Sox were in any way violating the rules before we found out about it? So I, I'd say the short answer is 
Yeah, kind of. There were, there were things about the, the Astros, the Red Sox, and the Yankees pre-Aaron Boone. He was not the manager. He was my broadcast partner at the time. Um, the Red Sox and the, and the Yankees had actually been disciplined by baseball in 2017, I think it was. Yeah, 2016, um, maybe, for issues with an Apple Watch. There were little things about technology um, that you were hearing. There was always a, a little suspicion that the Astros were up to something funny. But to the extent that we later found out, I had no idea. And to me, it's crazy that they were banging a, a trash can, that that's what they came up with. They didn't think they would get caught. But um, the, the Astros, um, the Red Sox and the Yankees, and even the Dodgers a little bit, you heard a little bit of stuff, but the Astros more um, than anybody else, but not to the level that we later found out. And a follow-up question Do you think that the punishment to them was adequate to both teams, maybe, because it says, uh, uh, the second part of this question, should they be forced to forfeit a World Series title? Both the Red Sox and the Astros potentially could have won titles while yeah. this was going on. Yeah, so the Red Sox offenses were not as serious as the Astros. If there are, you know, levels of wrong, what the Astros did was worse. Um, it is, though, a slippery slope. There's no precedent to taking away um, a, a World Series championship. And I know that may not be a good enough reason, but... I think my answer is no. I, I, as wrong as it was, uh, I don't think that the championship should have been taken, should have been taken away. Uh, and, and I really don't have a good reason to back that up because I know what they did was wrong. It just feels like that it's not something that um, I think it would have had consequences, maybe unintended consequences. And, and where do you draw the line? Because if, you know, if what the Astros did, you take it away, but the Red Sox didn't do something as bad, you take theirs away, and then you just award it to the Dodgers because they lost in the World Series. So um, I, I know it's not a perfect answer, or not even close, but I don't think it should have been taken away. And the last one, do you think that the Astros would have won the World Series had they done it clean, not cheated in this way, which is it's a tough hypothetical. Yes, and this will contradict, I guess, what I, I said in my last answer, but no, I don't think they would have won it. You don't think somebody would have beat them? No. Either the Yankees, didn't they, the Yankees took them to seven, right, in the ALCS. Although there's rumors um, that that wasn't, you know, that, that whole That might not have been kosher, too, right? And then the Dodgers <laughs> took them to seven, I think, in the World Series. But um, no, I, I don't think they would have won it. And, and when you look mm -hmm. at the numbers, to me, it's one thing that, you know, they had the highest slugging percentage and all that, but they also struck out the least. And if you know what's coming, you might not be able to, you know, you played Ben at a high level. If you know what's coming, you might not hit it well, but you're probably not going to swing and miss very much because you know what's coming. If it's a curveball, a changeup, a fastball, whatever, whatever it may be. So <laughs> it, it, if they had been completely uh, by the books, no, I don't think they would have won the World Series. Well, thank you, Ron, for those questions. I appreciate it. I see your, your mic is unmuted now. Um, and yes, I, I definitely agree. If, had I known that curveballs were coming to me, I don't think I would have struck out nearly <laughs> as often as I did throughout yeah. my minor league baseball career. But we appreciate your questions, Ron. Thank you very much. Um, another question comes from a viewer, Len Sedinsky. And his question is, how do you keep your timetable straight with all of the travel that you do? And when do you sleep? <laughs> well, I, I need more sleep than I used to. When I was young, uh, I, I would do crazy things. So I, I would do a game on the West Coast in Los Angeles that would end at, say, 10 o'clock L.A. time. And then I'd go to the airport and catch a, a 1 a.m. red eye from L.A., to Toronto that would land at eight in the morning and maybe get back into the house in time to drop Ben off at school. Uh, and then I might go home and have a nap uh, and then, you know, be ready to go when the kids got home from school. It was a lot easier to do when I was 33. I'm 53 now. It's a lot harder. Um, I would sleep, I sleep great on planes. So uh, I, I do that. But uh, that's one thing when I talk to broadcasting students is, uh, you know, don't get into this if you're not prepared to have a bit of a crazy life, whether it's working nights, weekends, traveling, moving, whatever the case may be. I, I've, I've been on more 6 a.m. flights I, I, uh, than I can imagine. And, and 
6 a.m. flight means a 4 a.m. wake up, but I'm not complaining. It's it's a small part of what has been, uh, you know, a very great a uh, great job. Um, but I, I I sleep I sleep when I can, and uh, I need a lot more. You know, it's funny with the pandemic. I go to bed at 9:30 every night now, and I'm used to working games that could go till 10, 11, midnight. You know, even later, depending on how long they go, how many innings. I've done 19 inning baseball games that ended at 1:30 in the morning. And now during the pandemic, I can't stay up past 930. I hope I'm able to go do my job again once or whenever this is over. Thank you for the question, Len. Appreciate it. The next one, I see we're a bit over time, by the way, but I'll get to all the questions if Don't worry about you're it. okay with it. Uh, the next one comes from Janet and Arthur, and they ask, what advice would you give to a young sports journalist who has been writing for the past several years if he would like to get into the broadcasting side? Uh, so I assume this is somebody in the industry already. So like at Sportsnet, guys like Shai Davidi and Arden Swelling and Ben Nicholson-Smith, they're writers. But, you know, as I said before, be as versatile as you can be. They now do podcasts and TV hits and radio hits. And I don't know what stage the young journalist is at that Janet and Arthur um, are referring to. Um, you know what, guys, if I can suggest, I think we've got a mute mic. I think we've got to mute the, uh, if that's okay, keep everybody muted if that's all right. Um, I, I think I would suggest that uh, whoever it is that they're working for, again, I don't know much about the, the situation, but whoever it is that they're working for, uh, if they go to their boss, if there are opportunities to do podcasts, radio, TV, YouTube, whatever, just say, how do I get involved? Um, and, and, and again, I don't know the entity that the person in question is working for, if, um, but uh, the way the business is going right now is is the more versatile everybody you are, the more valuable you are. And, um, you know, as you know, Ben, getting on air to do anything at any level is good experience. If people who are evaluating you don't care really where you're doing it. They just care how you sound and that you get repetition. So the more experience you can get doing anything, the better. Yeah, I got a reply actually mid, uh, mid answer from you that says he's working for the score. And I will say, I oh, think good. I can say for both of us, we're pretty big readers of the score like i i use the yep. score app often that's our, that's our go-to app yeah oh yeah and you'd be surprised yeah. going to american school how many of them use that as their go-to app that's true with no yep. idea that it's from canada thank you jen and arthur for the question move on to benji richler i hope i pronounced that correctly uh hi dan huge j slash leafs fan do you think jordan groshans has a high likely high likelihood of being an elite third baseman to take over if slash when Vladdy has to move to first base or DH? Uh, yes. I think Jordan Groshans is going to be a star, whether it's a shortstop or a third baseman. I don't know. He's big for a shortstop. My guess is that Groshans eventually is at third. Vladdy is eventually at first. Bo sticks it short. And second base could be Kevin Biggio or second base could be uh, Austin Martin. But Martin can play center field and Biggio can play right and Bo could move to second. And, uh, you know, these are good problems to have. So, but I'm a huge Jordan Groshans fan. Uh, I've never met him, but everything I know about him, read about him, have heard about him, uh, is that he's a terrific kid and a terrific competitor as well. And if he stays healthy, I think he's going to be a Blue Jay probably in 2022. And I think they'll give Vladdy some time to see if he can stick at third. And if he can, that's great. Like, they're going to find a place for all of these guys to play. But if I had to guess, I would guess Groshans would be at third base. And Vladdy probably moves across to first. And you kind of answered a follow-up question he had already about Austin Martin and infield depth in the positional cycle. But there was a third follow-up that was pertaining to what specifically was in your 2023 Blue Jays lineup. I'm trying to find it right now on my phone. And I just did. Here we go. So I can read it out if you'd like. All right. So sure. it's short. I didn't, and I think this is sent in batting order, too. Yes. So short hitting first, Bo Bichette. At second and hitting second, Kevin Biggio. At thir hitting third and playing center field, Austin Martin. At cleanup, playing first, Vladimir Guerrero Jr. At third and hitting fifth, Jordan Groshans. Hitting sixth and in left field, Lourdes Gurriel Jr., you had the DH slotted in at seventh with no one there. I'm going to personally put Rowdy Telez in, or maybe a little Tay Oscar Hernandez, because I could see him in the lineup as well. Randall Gritchick in right field hitting eighth, and I think that's a pretty good eighth hitter. And then Danny Jansen catching and hitting ninth. 
Thank you for the questions, Benji. Appreciate it. Do you have any extra comments on that lineup? Well, I, I don't know about you. Like, I, I, I'm i the one who said it to you, and I'm excited to hear you read it back to me. And, and I'm not like a Pollyanna, everything's going to be great and all that. But that's, that's legit, guys. Like, that's, that's really good. And, and not everybody's going to pan out. But I, I think the Blue Jays have as good a young nucleus of position players as anybody in baseball. But, you know, for, there's got to be baseball, and their pitching has to get deeper, which it is. But uh, I think from 2023 through 2025, six, uh, I think it's going to be a lot of fun here. I think it's going to be like the good old days. So another question from Ricky Klug, and this is towards both me and you. Uh, it's what was your biggest achievement? So I'll, I'll just answer quickly because I don't think mine's going to be nearly as long or interesting. <laughs> um, I guess my biggest achievement right now, I'm, I'm still pretty, pretty early within my career. But I think getting into Syracuse University for me was a uh, – I was, I was very proud of that. It took a lot of hard work. I wrote the ACT, which is an equivalent test to the SAT, and I went down to Syracuse and did an interview. interview. And there's still a, there's a piece of paper up in my childhood room. I've switched in my house, but my old room that has some sort of note I wrote saying that I would go to Syracuse University when I was young. So I, I think at some point around, you know, eight or nine, I had asked my dad, you know, where all the best sportscasters go to school. He told me Syracuse because they've produced great American broadcasters like Bob Costas and Mike Tirico. And so the day, the day I got accepted there, even though I put everything into it, was still pretty unbelievable for me. It was like my college signing day or draft day <laughs> to watch that that acceptance letter come through online was, was a very, uh, was a very happy moment for me. Yeah. And I would agree. I was just as proud. It is very, very hard to get into. It is tremendously competitive. Um, and I was very, very happy for Ben because that was clearly his first choice. Uh, he is also minoring in political science. So he's a uh, digital broadcast and journalism major with a minor in political science. And if I can fell a bit, he's been on the honor roll all four terms that he has been in Syracuse. So I'm, uh, very proud of him for that. Um, my biggest accomplishment, I don't know if I'd say it's an accomplishment, but I think doing Sunday Night Baseball on ESPN would be what I would say. It, it's, it's, a heck of a, it's a heck of a job, and, and it's, the, it's the game of the week and all that. In the seven years I did it, uh, were very special to, uh, to me in a number of ways, and it was a hard decision to leave. I had mixed feelings about it, although I I did it for a lot of personal reasons as well as professional, and I'm and I'm uh, they were the right reasons, and I'm very happy that I did it. But uh, I would say Sunday night baseball probably would be the answer for me. And to go back a question, just because I just saw a response, Benji Richler, who asked the last question, he's big on Rowdy Teles too. That's who I think my okay. DH is for 2023. We'll move on to the next question from Gail Kurtzman, who actually asked us a couple that I'll get to after as well. But this might be the toughest question you have to answer all day. Are we going to have a 2020 baseball season? Well, today was not a good day. Um, and not to get too, you know, too far down the rabbit hole here, but uh, Commissioner Rob Manfred said some things today and the Players Association fired back and uh, the two sides just, it, it, it's, it's a mess. It, it's an absolute mess right now, how much they dislike and distrust each other. And I still think there will be a season I think it'll be a short season, 50, 54 games, something like that. Um, all kinds of acrimony and hard feelings, and, and it's not going to be what we've come to expect. Um, but I, I think at the end of the day, both sides will realize that something bad is better than nothing at all. Uh, but I, I, I do think what's happened is terrible. I, I think all the public fighting when 40 million Americans and 3 million Canadians, or whatever the numbers are, are out of work, um, I think it's shameful, to be honest with you. And I think they should have found a way to make this work. It wasn't going to be easy, and they, they don't have to like each other. But I think there needed to be people on the Zoom call uh, for the two sides in the virtual room to say, we got to find a way to get this done. We have an opportunity here to lead the way and to give people a diversion and to make people feel good and, and, and so on. And so, yes, I think there will be some kind of a season but I think baseball's already done itself a lot of damage with what's happened over the last month or so. So I'm just going to skip forward a little and then go back just because I saw a question further down the line that is a good follow-up to that one. Uh, Mark Felberg asks, 
if you feel that seemingly tone deaf approach that baseball is taking, considering that we're in the midst of a pandemic will irreparably harm baseball going forward. Yeah, I think there will be some damage. You know, is it, do we feel it 50 years from now, 20 years from now? I, I don't know. But, it, but yeah, um, I mean, if my Twitter feed is any indication, some people basically say to the two sides, I'm done. I'm out. Uh, I have no interest in you. I'll find a, a, a better way to spend my time and spend my money. Uh, so, yes, uh, I think there will be damage. My bigger, I mean, that's a big concern, just as big is that baseball's demographics are not good. They don't have as many young fans. And, and I think baseball needs to uh, put its, the bickering between the two sides aside and, and figure out a way to appeal to young people and, and put the fans first, like really, really legitimately put the fans first. And I don't think they do a very good job of that. And then one of the final questions we have from Arez Sherman, who says he's from Syracuse, which I'm a big fan of, go Orange. Huge college basketball fan. I've seen you many times at the Carrier Dome. Would love your thoughts on the future of amateurism in college sports, play, paying athletes, et cetera. Uh, so the, the times they are changing and uh, amateur athletes, collegiate athletes now have the right to go out and market themselves. They can do endorsements and card shows and things like that. And eventually, I, I think they just might get paid by, by colleges. You want to go play basketball at Kentucky? Kentucky offers you this on top of a scholarship. North Carolina offers you that, and you get to choose. So uh, I think the, 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 the notion of amateurism in college sports, I think it's a bit of a blurry line, and it's continuing to, to, to move in one direction. And I think people are saying, you know, it's, it's the athletes, it's the college football and basketball players who bring in all that revenue, and they don't get to keep any of that revenue. And, and I think it's going to change. I, I, I still do feel that getting a full scholarship to go to a great school, room and board and scholarship, that's pretty good. Like, that's not something to sneeze at. But I, I do think that uh, there will be more to it in the next few years. All right, and that does it for the audience questions. Thank you, everyone who submitted. And Thank you, everyone who is listening to us. I really appreciate it. And I'll <laughs> hand it over to Ron Laxer now for the final thank yous of the Zoom call. Well, first of all, thanks uh, very much, uh, Dan and Ben. Um, many of you on the call may know that Sandy Koufax is my hero and the definition of excellence in absolutely any aspect of life. So, Dan, there's no question you're the Sandy Koufax of sport, sports broadcasting. And it was an <laughs> honor to uh, have you with us. And Ben, with, with your genes and the Syracuse pedigree, uh, I'm pretty confident that in a few years from now, we'll have a similar session with you being interviewed by your dad. Uh, <laughs> sir, I, I, I will do that in a heartbeat, Ron. Yeah, I, so I'm available to do that. We're going to schedule that in for a, a few years from now. So again, I'd like to thank you both on behalf of Beth Tikva, Rabbi Grover. A special thanks to you for participating, your very insightful question to the Adult Education Committee and the Committee on uh, Jews and Sports from Beth Tikva, our subcommittee, led by uh, Howard Price and Lionel Berger. Thanks to all. Uh, thanks also to the office staff, without whom these programs don't happen, to uh, Seagal, to Gail, and to Rick for putting the flyer and uh, the announcement together. Thanks very much to you. And I, before everybody leaves, I want to tell you about the next session in the program, which is going to be nearly as outstanding as tonight's was. There's a fabulous movie called Jews and Baseball. Dan, I'm sure you've seen it. Uh, you might even be in it. Uh, ben, you, you should see it if you haven't. It's going to be screened starting tomorrow from June 16th to 22nd, available if you register, followed on June 22nd by a question and answer period with the director, Will Heckman. So uh, please uh, put that in your schedules and we look forward to seeing you all on June 22nd. Thanks very much to all. Uh, ride safely home. Uh, I don't think anybody's riding, but stay safe and look forward to seeing you on June 22nd. Bye for now. Thank you to everybody. Be safe. Thanks. Good to see you all. Thanks everyone. Have a good night. Bye Ricky. Thank you, thank you, thank you.